everyone to our second OSHER virtual lunch and learn. We are excited to have you all with us today. We will be hearing from Bim Oliver in just a moment. Uh, we're going to take questions today, but we will hold them to the end. When Bim is done, he'll present for about 50 minutes. So if you have any questions as he goes on, please put them in the Q&A, which is the two bubbles at the bottom of your screen. And I will read those for you to Bim at the end. If you'd like to chat, that is visible to everyone in the meeting today. The Q&A will just be visible to me. So if you'd like to chat amongst yourselves or put in comments for everyone to see, you're welcome. Uh, we welcome that interaction that we all need right now. And I am going to turn the time over to Sandy Clark, who is our Lunch and Learn Coordinator volunteer and also a member of our curriculum committee and she works very hard behind the scenes to set up these uh, speakers and topics for us all to enjoy. Sandy? Oh, thank you, Jill. I'd like to welcome everybody to our Lunch and Learn today. Um, so this is going to be a very interesting presentation again. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Bim Oliver and along with being an instructor here for OSHER, he is a writer and lecturer on arch architecture. His publications include the book, South Temple Street Landmarks and Salt Lake City's First Historic District, as well as articles on Utah's architecture in various locations and national periodicals. Currently, he is working on a history of the Salt Lake City Airport. Bim also taught guitar to a diversity of students. His credits as an instructor include classes in beginning guitar for the OSHA program and in swing guitar for Salt Lake Community Education. He's also provided a number of, of lectures on architectural, uh, and I would like to welcome him today. And with this, I'd like to turn it over to you, Bim. Okay, thanks, Sandy. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna talk about modernist architecture in Utah. And we're going to take a little tour of modernist architecture. We're going to start with the origins of modernism in Europe, uh, and then we're going to look at how modernism migrated to the United States and was adapted here in America. And then we'll land in Utah and talk about how modernism evolved in Utah and finish with uh, kind of a retrospective, if you will, on its significance for the Utah architectural landscape. So we're going to start with uh, the origins of modernist, the origins of modernist architecture. And uh, I think it's important to understand these origins for a couple of reasons. First, to uh, better understand uh, modernist significance in architectural history, if you will, but also to gain a greater appreciation of what modernist architecture represents visually of its aesthetic influences, if you will. So we're gonna get in the way back machine and we're gonna go back to the turn of the 20th century, really, uh, probably about a 30 year period from roughly 1885 to 1915. And during this period, there was a group of architects and architectural thinkers in Europe who were influenced by a number of factors that were coming together really at the same time. Those factors included architectural influences. Uh, this image here is of the Paris Opera House constructed in the 1870s and it's a good example of what American architect Philip Johnson would later refer to as the chaos of eclecticism. There's a whole lot of everything going on on this building, a lot of visual ideas, a lot of decorative and ornamental ideas that may or may not have any historical meaning, any symbolic meaning. And for some architects of this time period, the late 1900s, or excuse me, late 1800s in Europe, this kind of architecture, this eclectic architecture, suggested that architecture had kind of lost its way, that it had sort of moved away from the essential ideas that should be the foundation for architectural design. Well, in the early 1900s, these architects, these European architects were introduced to a very different set of visual ideas coming from an American architect named Frank Lloyd Wright. And they were introduced to these ideas in a publication called the Wasmuth Portfolio, published in Germany in 1910. It was a series of drawings of Wright's Prairie School uh, style homes. And 
this, these ideas were, were very different, obviously, than what was going on in Europe at the time. And they showed to these European architects the possibilities of a new style of architecture. There were artistic influences playing in as well. There were artists at the turn of the 20th century, around the turn of the 20th century in Europe, who were playing with different ideas of perspective and composition. So you see paintings, for example, like the one in the upper right by Picasso, where the artist, where Picasso takes the image of a, of a small town, he literally pulls it apart, and then he puts it back together in a very different way to give himself and those viewing the, the painting a different sense of perspective, a different sense of how these visual realities could come together. Mondrian was another artist who had a tremendous influence on these architectural thinkers because he wasn't really playing with real visual ideas. He wasn't looking at a small town or at a, 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 a bouquet of flowers. He was simply playing with um, composition, with shapes and colors and how they might play off against and with one another. So these artistic influences were, were significant for these architectural thinkers. There were technological changes as well. Um, these two buildings show a kind of a divergent uh, set of realities that were going on in the late 19, 1800s in Europe. The first reality is that there were new structural uh, materials that were available that would allow architects to design buildings in very new and different ways. But the other reality was that despite the fact that these architects had these new materials that would allow them to do that kind of design, they still designed buildings in very traditionalist ways. So on the left, you have the Bon Marche department store in London, constructed in 1877, built the, the framework, the structure of this building was structural steel, but it looks very much like any of the other Victorian buildings that would have lined a, a London street at the time. On the right is the Maison Ennebique, uh, the first reinforced concrete building constructed in Paris in 1892. And again, it looks very much like the traditional architecture of Paris. But there were these architects that were looking at these new materials who said, perhaps they give us an opportunity to do things very differently. And finally, there were socioeconomic influences. Uh, certainly at the turn of the 20th century, you, uh, Europe was uh, on the verge of a collapse. They, you know, we were on this march toward uh, World War I, and there was significant social disparity, socioeconomic disparity. Um, there was tremendous depression in Europe, and there was a great sense of disenfranchisement. And this group of architectural thinkers whom I've referred to looked at these social conditions and felt that architecture could, among other things, serve to address these profound social issues. So out of these influences, these architects produced a new paradigm for architecture, a new way of thinking about design. They believed, for example, that architecture should return to its essence, that it should move away from the chaos of eclecticism towards a more, a, a purer sense of form, um, towards ideas that really came directly from classical architecture, from Greek and Roman architecture. That the function of a building or its functions should define its form. Um, form is the architect's word for shape. So the functions of a building really should derive, or excuse me, the shapes of a building really should derive from its essential functions. And symmetry was no longer an absolute. Um, symmetry could be a secondary goal of, a, of an architectural form uh, dependent on its function. The design of buildings now should express these new materials. I mentioned the steel that the Bon Marche was constructed out of and the reinforced concrete uh, that the Maison Ennebique was constructed out of. We were also able to produce glass in new ways. So we had steel and concrete and glass as these kind of new materials in many ways and the architects who were looking at the possibility of changing architecture felt that these materials should be expressed as part of the design. And finally, architecture should strive to improve society, that architecture could play a role in addressing those social issues that I referred to earlier. And I want to read to you from the Manifesto of the Bauhaus. Now, the Bauhaus was a design school 
uh, instituted in Germany in 1919. It included architecture as part of its curriculum. And the fact that its members felt compelled to issue a manifesto tells you quite a bit about how they felt about their role in society. But I wanna read you from the manifesto. Let us together desire, conceive, and create the new building of the future, which will combine everything, architecture and sculpture and painting, in a single form, which will one day rise toward the heavens from the hands of the million workers as the crystalline symbol of a new and coming faith. This is high idealism. And I will tell you that later architects and architectural critics and architectural historians had a fairly strong negative reaction to this idealism. They felt that it was kind of highfalutin, that it was almost arrogant to think, you know, for architects to think that they could somehow solve social problems through architecture. Well, what visual ideas did this new paradigm produce? Well, there were three architects who have been most closely associated with um, the, the generation, if you will, of these new visual ideas, the generation of this new uh, set of architectural values. And their buildings are represented here. On the left is the Weisenhof House designed by Le Corbusier. In the upper right is the actual building of the Bauhaus designed by Walter Gropius. And in the lower right is the Villa Tugendat uh, designed by Mies van der Rohe. And these buildings share certain visual values that were very much a part of this, this emerging new style of architecture in Europe. They are geometric. They have straight lines and right angles. They're kind of hard edge in a lot of ways. They have a distinct absence of applied ornamentation. We're moving away from this eclectic type of architecture that we saw in the Paris uh, uh, Opera House. And there is a prevailing use of the color white. It's not absolute, but it's a prevalent use of the color white in order to emphasize what they would call the planar qualities of the buildings. Planar, P-L-A-N-A-R, referring to this desire to create these absolutely flat surfaces. There's this use of these new materials, steel and glass and concrete, and really a celebration of these materials as modern, as kind of indicating that we're moving to a new era of society. And finally, a de-emphasis on symmetry. It's no longer an absolute. It's not illegal to design buildings that are symmetrical, but because we're looking at function as the primary driver of the design, um, function as Philip Johnson, whom we mentioned earlier, would later say is asymmetrical. So you design buildings that are inherently asymmetrical. These were the new visual ideas coming out of Europe and, uh, and they would come to influence not only American architecture, but Utah architecture as well. So we're gonna move into America and we're, right now we're at about 1930 roughly. And we see these ideas coming from Europe into the United States and in, in really in two different ways. The first is that there are individual architects who are emigrating to the United States from Europe. Um, they include uh, William Lecaz, who's, uh, who designed the building on the left, the Philadelphia Savings Fund Society building, um, and Richard Neutra, whose Lovell House on the right was constructed in 1929. But Lecaz and Neutra were both significantly influenced by um, the Bauhaus, that school of design that we mentioned earlier. And these buildings really reflect those basic ideas that we saw in the images of the buildings designed by Le Corbusier and Gropius and Van der Rohe, uh, you know, straight lines, right angles. The Philadelphia Savings Fund Society building does include these gently rounded corners uh, right here and up through the building itself kind of a reference, if you will, to the modern styles that had preceded modernism in the United States. But basically this building in particular is a very different style for urban architecture in the United States. And the Neutra building on the right introduces again, these radical new visual ideas to California, to the Los Angeles area. Uh, I should say that the greater influence uh, from the, this introduction of European modernism was through an exhibition 
um, called the international style. Now, the, the international style was a name given to European modernism as it came from Europe by the curators of this exhibition, one of which was Philip Johnson and the other was uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock. Um, the international style, as they coined it, really didn't refer so much to the visual aspects of these uh, of modernism at, per se. It really referred to the concept that, and one of the goals of um, the architects who adopted these styles, one of the goals was to have an architecture that was universal in nature, that didn't belong to a, a certain culture or social class. So the international style is really a reference to, again, this sense of social uh, idealism that was part of this architecture. But this exhibition was significantly influential in the US because it started in New York and then it traveled around the country. So architects throughout the United States were introduced to these, again, these radical visual ideas coming out of Europe. Well, for most Americans, um, the radical visual ideas of the international style were a little too radical and it didn't really gain wide acceptance throughout the country. So by the 1940s, there were architects in America who were intrigued by these ideas and wanted to play around with them a little bit, but realized that their clients maybe wouldn't be willing to embrace them fully. Architects like Joseph Eichler, whose home, uh, whose, whose design is reflected in this home in the upper right. Uh, Joseph Eichler was a designer and builder in California, very prolific. And he took the basic ideas of the international style. Again, you can see straight lines, right angles, lots of glass, using structural steel as the basis for the structure of the building. But he incorporated naturalistic materials. He incorporated, for example, wood here in these walls um, to soften the hard edges of the international style. Uh, he was one of the progenitors of what would later be called Bay Area Modernism, this same basic ideas that are inherent in European modernism, but softening them with naturalistic materials. By the 1960s, the adaptations of the international style of European modernism had progressed to the point at which, in some ways, it might be unrecognizable. But this image in the lower right is of a development called Sea Ranch, which is on the California coast about three hours north of San Francisco. Sea Ranch was designed by a group of architects who in essence created something of a hybrid. They took the basic ideas of European modernism, the basic ideas of geometric lines, very simple forms, a lack of explicit ornamentation, and they assimilated them with um, the ideas coming out of the regional vernacular architecture of that area. The regional vernacular architecture of the coast in that area was of the ranches that existed along the coast. So they, they created this hybrid of sort of modern, sort of ranch modernism, if you will, um, with these wonderful sloping roofs that um, mimic the roofs of the barns that were in the area. And the incorporation, extensive use, uh, in fact, exclusive use, if you will, of weathered barn wood as the cladding or sheathing material for these buildings. It was really kind of a transformative moment in American modernism. Um, but you can see that architects now are, are really kind of moving away from the basic ideas of modernism as we saw in Europe uh, towards something that's a little more uh, accessible for the American taste. Um, there were other derivations of modernism. There were other explorations, if you will, that were taking off from the basic principles of the international style. In the upper left is an example of um, what came to be known as new formalism. It was a style, a derivative, if you will, of, of modernism that was uh, forwarded by, in, in particular, by two architects, Minoru Yamasaki and Edward Durrell Stone. And here you see in the Northwestern Mutual Life Building designed by Yamasaki, an effort to return to some of those basic classical ideas that had been the inspiration for the early modernists. A sense of monumentality, of making buildings feel really big. I mean, imagine the typical Greek temple. It feels big. Well, they wanted for buildings to feel monumental. 
they return to an emphasis on symmetry, on having a balance in the basic look of a building. But more to the point, they incorporated extensive use of arches. Uh, so you can see this colonnade of arches that kind of parades around the facade um, as a way to giving, to providing a direct reference to the classical ideas that they were working from. We also have uh, by this time, a more extensive use of concrete and the developments of a style of, of modernism called brutalism. Um, this building in the lower left is uh, the Yale Art and Architecture Building designed by American architect Paul Rudolph. And you can see that um, it, it's all concrete, except for glass, of course, but structurally, it's all concrete. It, but one of the things that architects who were experimenting with brutalism were trying to accomplish was to allow concrete to be expressive, to allow it to have a sculptural value, if you will. Speaking of sculptural, uh, if you look at the building on the right, we've moved now to a point at which it feels as if we've almost abandoned entirely the original principles of modernism. The building on the right is one of my favorite buildings. It's the TWA terminal at JFK Airport designed by Eero Saarinen. It's an example of what would be called neo-expressionism. It's very expressive. Buildings now can be expressive. And what's interesting to me about this building, if you think back to Maison Ennebique uh, that we looked at in an earlier slide that was constructed out of reinforced concrete, which at the time was a new material. Well, we have now a building that's constructed out of the same material. But by this time, architects such as Saarinen were able to take this material and because as they would call, as they would term it, concrete is plastic, you can form it, you can shape it into any number of different shapes. And Saarinen was able to create this incredibly graceful shape that resembles, that's supposed to uh, suggest an airplane taking off. So you have these derivations of modernism now that are moving us quite a ways away from the original principles of the international style. Well, we're gonna to move to Utah now, and we're gonna see how modernism plays out in Utah. We do have some examples of the international style in Utah. There aren't many, and I think there are three primary reasons that there aren't many examples of this style of architecture in Utah. The first is really a matter of timing. Um, as I mentioned, the most significant influence coming out of the early entry of uh, modernism in the United States was from this exhibit uh, called the International Style. That exhibit occurred through the 1930s. And when you think about the 1930s, the 1930s, of course, were the period of the Great Depression. And Utah suffered from the Great Depression just about as much as any other state. So really, I think we were probably more preoccupied with just trying to survive than we were with adopting new architectural ideas. The second reason is that once we did emerge from the Great Depression, we went into World War II. And the materials that might have been utilized for buildings of this style were diverted to the war effort. But the third reason, and I think probably the more significant one, is that Utahns have historically had a very conservative artistic aesthetic. Um, and that's true for their architectural aesthetic as well. Um, in the 1930s and 1940s, Utah really was still very much about um, traditionalist architectural styles, what might be called the revivalist styles like classical revival and colonial revival and period revival styles like Tudor architecture. Those were much more popular here because I think they appeal to the basic cultural aesthetic here. These images that you see here probably would not have had a broad appeal. Nevertheless, we do have some examples of this style. On the left is a home in Salt Lake constructed in 1938. And on the right is what I might consider to be the purest form of the international style in Utah. It's the Utah Education Association building at Third East and South Temple Street, uh, constructed in 1952, designed by Utah architect Lowell Parrish. And you can see this could have been in that initial slide that I showed of buildings designed by 
Grobius, Vondero, and Le Corbusier. It has the same, very same visual ideas. Well, because the international style wasn't really widely embraced here in Utah, um, architects felt a need to kind of soften it a little bit, as we saw in the image of the Eichler house uh, earlier. Um, I think the international style, because it was sort of progressive architecturally, had appealed to architects of that period. And we're going to talk in a minute about another reason why it might have had an appeal for architects. But in and of itself, it's new visual ideas. And I think for that reason, architects wanted to experiment with it. But they knew their clients weren't really going to accept it fully. So we see examples of buildings that are kind of hybrid international style buildings. On the left is the Moreton Insurance Company building constructed in 1960 on South Temple Street. And if you look at this building, along the really the left, the two thirds left side of the facade, it's very much out of the international style. It's straight lines, right angles. We're now using aluminum extensively instead of steel for framing windows, but the same idea, you know, the expression of modern materials. And it's a little difficult to see in this slide, and I apologize, but on the right is a set of panels of, of green marble that are there strictly for decoration. They're there to kind of soften the hard edges of the international style to provide maybe a sense of elegance to this building. And the same kind of idea is present here in this building on the right, the State Bank of Southern Utah, or excuse me, I'm sorry, the Bank of St. George, um, which was constructed in 1959. Um, the right side of this facade is international style to the core. Um, and in fact, we're expressing these steel columns here and we have these wonderful large windows, but we're also softening the hard edges of the international style a little bit with this wall of sandstone, very much a part of the design of this building. It brings color and texture and contrast to this building that wouldn't otherwise exist if it weren't there. So architects in Utah were doing very much what Joseph Eichler was doing in California and bringing natural materials to the mix, so to speak, to the, the visual ideas that were being presented to Utah clients. Well, about this time, we also have a set of new influences that would profoundly affect Utah architecture. Um, in 1949, the University of Utah instituted its School of Architecture. It had not had a School of Architecture prior to this. And it appointed as the first dean of the School of Architecture, Roger Bailey, who is pictured in the article on the left. Roger Bailey was, to his core, a modernist. And he hired a modernist faculty, including in the upper right, Charlie Moore, who was one of the architects who would go on to design the Sea Ranch project that we looked at earlier, and Steve McDonald in the lower right, who was characterized by Utah architect Will Louie, who went through this school of architecture as follows. I think he had the reputation of being the most innovative architect in that period. His houses, every one was different. He tried new theories on every house. So we have this new school of architecture that is profoundly modernist and is teaching modernist principles to architects like Will Louie, who went through that school and others who would go on to design some of our great architecture of the middle of the 20th century. There were, however, influences coming from other places. It was by the late 1940s and early 1950s, much easier to access information about what was going on in other parts of the country. So Utah architects were exposed to the work of um, American architects like I.M. Pei in the upper right and Louis Kahn hunched over his drafting table there in the lower right, who were taking basic modernist ideas and moving them in very different directions. Utah architects were also influenced by publications like Arts and Architecture Magazine, which was published in California through the middle of the 20th century. And one of the most important things that Arts and Architecture Magazine did was that it sponsored what was called the Case Study Houses Project. It was an attempt by Arts and Architecture to bring modernism into the mainstream. Up until this time, 
in the US, modernism had been perceived as something of a, an elitist style of architecture. And arch arts and architecture was attempting by commissioning famous American architects like I am Pei to design modernist houses. Arts and Architecture magazine was attempting to bring those ideas to the middle class, so to speak. So not only to make them acceptable culturally, if you will, but to make them affordable financially. So there were these influences that were at play here, kind of a cauldron of influences that were at play um, in the US and in Utah as well, that were affecting young architects coming out of the School of Architecture at the University of Utah, as well as other places. Well, the result of all of this kind of bubbling, if you will, all of this kind of of, of turbulence in a way, if you will, of, this, of these many ideas that were at play um, about what modernism could be. The result of all of this was what I call stylized modernism. So you started to see Utah architects producing buildings that looked significantly different than the international style for sure, but certainly very, very different than the traditionalist architectural styles that had prevailed in Utah through really through the middle of the 20th century. And you have wonderful buildings appearing on the landscape like Trinity Presbyterian Church on the left, designed by Utah architect Birch Beale. And you can see this, this beautiful form, this really elegant form uh, and the sense of verticality with the spire of the, of the church. But these forms and these visual ideas really would not have been possible had we not gone through these early periods of modernism because what modernism did is it freed architects from the basic ideas of form that had been prevailing through the early part of the 20th century. We have buildings like the Steiner American Building here on the right, designed by Utah architect Bill Browning, one of my absolute favorite buildings. Uh, I think it's one of the most significant buildings in the state. Um, and Browning took, Browning was creating something of a hybrid in a sense because he took basic modernist visual values, straight lines, right angles, extensive use of glass, extensive use of concrete, but he incorporated brick into his design. All of this brown material you see is brick, which was not inherently a modernist material, but he wanted to celebrate Utah's masonry heritage, its brick heritage. So he created this wonderful hybrid of much more traditionalist architectural values with um, very stylized modernist architectural values. Really a beautiful example of how modernism could adapt to the landscape because this building sits on South Temple Street at Fifth East. And Robert Woody, who was a, a columnist with the Salt Lake Tribune at the time that this building was constructed in the middle of the 1960s, mentioned that these columns, these concrete columns that Browning had incorporated into the design really carried through the same visual ideas that were present in the great mansions that lined South Temple. Uh, really a wonderful example of how you can bring something very different and yet have it be compatible with the existing landscape. Well, we started to move stylized, the concept of stylized modernism even further. We moved the, new, the needle even further with buildings that began to incorporate decorative elements for their own sake. And those decorative elements became not really in a sense kind of secondary to the design as we saw with the Moreton Insurance Building and the Bank of Southern Utah earlier, they became primary visual features. And that concept of having decorative elements be primary visual features was nothing that would have appeared in the, the modernist design book that Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe and uh, Le Corbusier were working with. It would have been an anathema to them. Nevertheless, we see that those ideas starting to appear in Utah, on the Utah architectural landscape. On the left is the um, Granger High School cafeteria designed by William Monroe. I don't believe this building is, in, is there anymore, unfortunately, but you can see that Monroe incorporated these decorative panels. I'm not sure what the material is. My guess is it's some kind of uh, formed concrete, but they have this great texture and color. And he has them not only here sort of forming a nice wall, but also parading around the outside of the cafeteria. 
Now those panels do have a functional value. They create shade for the cafeteria, but there's no reason to make them highly decorative like that. So we're incorporating decoration for its own sake. As we are with the home on the right. This is a modest home on Lincoln Lane and Holiday constructed in 1962. To be frank, I don't know who the architect is for sure. I have an idea, but I'm sure it's a Utah architect because um, homes that were being built in Utah at that time were not necessarily being designed by architects from out of state. And those that were would have been the high style homes. This certainly has a high style feel to it, but the footprint of this house is probably about a thousand feet, a um, thousand square feet. But you see there are elements here now that are incorporated strictly for their decorative value. This roof here, this wonderful V-shaped roof is what's called a butterfly roof. And it does carry certain structural properties, but for a building of this size, it's not necessary to construct a roof like that for its structural properties. I believe this butterfly roof is here on this home because it looks really cool. It looks modern. Um, yet at the same time, we have on the west wall of this home, this wall of stone. Um, there's no reason structurally or functionally to have a wall of stone there. That wall is there strictly for functional, or excuse me, strictly for decorative reasons. It's there strictly as ornamentation. So we have really moved away from the ideas that the founders of European modernism would have had about ornamentation. And that is that the ornamentation of a building should be in its structure, should be in its basic visual ideas in what the building is in, in and of itself, not in some applied form of decoration. And yet here we are, oh, what, 30 years later or so, and we're incorporating decorative elements for their own sake. We do have examples of some of these um, derivations, these derivatives of uh, modernism that I showed you in the earlier slide that appeared in the US. We have examples here in Utah. We have examples of new formalism, as you can see in the building on the left. Um, it's the Western General Agency building constructed for Edward Maybe, who was a financier and, um, and uh, owner of an insurance company. Uh, it was actually constructed over a period of several years. It's got a very interesting history, but you can see this building attempts to do what the Northwestern Mutual Life Building does that we saw in the earlier slide. It attempts to feel monumental. It attempts to feel really big, and it has this great sense of symmetry. Now, this wind, or excuse me, this doorway on the left was added later, so it, to, to a certain extent, breaks up the visual symmetry. But if you can sort of take that doorway out of your perspective, you can see that the building is symmetrical. Symmetry is all about implying stability and strength. And if you're an insurance company, that's what you want to imply. So you have these basic elements of new formalism, and of course, not the least of which is these vertical arches here, this colonnade of arches that are carried through in stucco uh, to the left and right uh, on the facade of this building. This is a great example of new formalism. We don't have a lot here in Utah. Um, and so as we're gonna uh, talk to at the end, we really need to focus on preserving these very few examples of some of these styles that we have. On the right is an example of brutalism. I mentioned brutalism earlier when we looked at the Yale Art and Architecture Building designed by Paul Rudolph. Um, this of course is the Social and Behavioral Sciences Building at the University of Utah designed by um, Utah architecture firm Panushka and Peterson. And um, it's a concrete high rise. Now, there are three reasons why the university built a concrete high rise. This was constructed, it was completed in 1971. But in the 1960s, when the university was um, planning to construct a building for the Department of uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences, um, concrete high rises were all the rage on college campuses. So one reason to incorporate this kind of building was to show that we're progressive like all those other institutes of higher education. Another reason to incorporate a concrete high rise was much more immediate. And that was that the university administration at the time wanted to uh, incorporate 
a vertical element, a vertical architectural element as a symbol of higher education that you could see from all over the Salt Lake Valley. But the primary reason that this was a concrete high rise was functional. Um, the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences following World War II had grown dramatically. There were new programs, many new students. So it needed a lot of space to house those programs and students. But the footprint on which this building was going to be constructed was relatively small. So you had to go vertical. So we have this wonderful example of brutalism. Um, reinforced concrete, as I mentioned earlier, was easy to work with. Um, it was also very inexpensive. So it became a very popular material following World War II, not only in institutions of higher education, but for other types of architecture throughout the world. Um, but I think this is a wonderful building. A lot of, a lot of people love to hate this building. Um, but I think if you look closely at it, there's some elements of it, there are some visual elements that are really dynamic. It has this wonderful set of almost random windows that walk up the west facade. And, and I would uh, encourage you, if you've never done so, walk right up to the building and touch it. Because when you touch it, you'll see the kind of thing that Le Corbusier was referring to when he coined the phrase beton brut, raw concrete. Le Corbusier became much more interested in his later works in working with concrete and playing with its, its textural and visual qualities. And what Panushkin Peterson did with this building was they had it finished in what's called hammered concrete, where you literally take something like a hammer and you beat the concrete until you create this wonderful textural finish. So if you haven't had a chance to do so, go check that out. It's a, it's an example of how concrete can display these wonderful visual qualities. We also have examples in Utah of abstraction and expressionism. Now we looked at a, an example of expressionism in the TWA terminal designed by Aero Saarinen. We have our own great examples here of similar visual ideas. In the upper right, is a Bravenel Hall. And if you walk along the east facade, the front facade of a Bravenel Hall, if you're walking along here and you turn the corner and you put your hand out, you're gonna touch air. <laughs> because this building makes this incredible obtuse angle. There's this wonderful obtuse angle uh, on the building's northeast corner. That angle and the shape that comes out of it, which is this wonderful abstracted shape is not there for functional reasons. It's simply a way to create visual interest. Uh, and I think it's a great example of what architects can do when they play around with form. I mentioned earlier at the, at the outset when we talked about the origins of modernism, that one of the things that came out of, um, out of the art world at the turn of the 20th century was the interest in playing with composition. And I think this is a great example of how that kind of matured uh, here in Utah, this idea that we can take shapes and work with them and play with them and create something very interesting and even dynamic. We also have example, an, a great example here on the lower right in Utah of expressionism. This is Nunemaker Place that sits on the south side of the campus of Westminster College. It was designed by Utah architecture firm Brixen and Christopher. Um, and it's just, a, I think it's an absolutely beautiful building. There is a reference here. It was designed to be the university's, or excuse me, the college's spiritual center. So you can see a, a, a reference here, a visual reference to Aspire. But other than that, this building is simply meant to evoke certain emotions, whatever emotions you want to feel. Um, but it's not a, a reference to any particular visual reality, if you will. It's simply a, a building that's meant to be expressive. <clears throat> one of the styles of modernism or one of the kind of um, eras or periods of modernism, if you will, that I didn't refer to earlier, um, but that does exist here in Utah is what's called corporate modernism. By the 1950s and into the 1960s, um, corporations around the country looked to modernism as expressing innovation, as expressing 
uh, progressivism, as, expe as expressing, you know, the, the idea that, you know, our company is, is with the times, we're, we're moving with the times. Somewhat ironically, though, at about the same time, because modernism had really kind of matured, if you will, it also started to express certain conservative values. So you see corporations like the LDS Church adopting modernism in its design of the church office building here on the left. And I had a chance to interview uh, Paul Anderson, who was a historian with the LDS Church, probably certainly one of the preeminent experts on LDS architecture. And he said that the adoption of this building, of this style, of, this, of these visual ideas, was really a reflection that the LDS Church at the time wanted to express the bureaucratization of the church. Now, he didn't mean that in a critical sense. And I think what he meant was that the LDS Church wanted to express through this building that it had arrived as a corporate institution. It was no longer an emerging relig religious institution. It now had established itself. On the right is uh, an example of what was going on with federal architecture at the time. In the early 1960s, John F. Kennedy commissioned a task force to look at federal architecture because he felt to some extent like it had become kind of sort of stodgy. Now, he didn't use that phrase, but that's what he was thinking. Uh, so he commissioned a task force to look at federal architecture to see if it could be somehow um, made more interesting or certainly made more current. And the task force returned with a report that recommended primarily that federal architecture, federal design started to incorporate um, the finest in contemporary architectural thought. That's the phrase that came out of the report. In other words, we wanna have federal buildings now be modernist in design. The building on the right is the Hanson Federal Building in Ogden, and it's a great example of federal modernism. This building here looks very much like what we saw in the first slide of modernist buildings designed by Gropius and Vandero and uh, Le Corbusier, except that it's symmetrical. So we have symmetry, which as I mentioned earlier, communicates strength and stability. That's what your government should be. Um, but it's also very regular in nature. Um, yet it has the same basic ideas of modernism, straight lines, right angles. So we see corporations and even government entities starting to adopt modernism as, in many ways, the official corporate style of architecture in America. And finally, um, modernism progressed to a point at which it kind of came full circle. Um, by the late 1970s and uh, into the 1980s, we see a style of modernism appearing that is sort of generically called late modernism. Um, it's a little more difficult at this time to start saying, well, that's a particular type of modernism because the ideas of modernism had been so adapted and had evolved to such a great extent that there was a whole plethora of visual ideas that related to modernism that didn't really have a, a, a particular stylistic designation. Nevertheless, there are characteristics of modernism from this time that are typical, that are more commonplace. And the primary two characteristics you see in these two buildings uh, in these images, and they are this emphasis on horizontality, this this profoundly horizontal profile of both of these buildings, even though the one on the left, which is Governor's Plaza, um, is, is a very vertical building. Um, but these bands of windows here that are called ribbon windows really emphasize the horizontality of the building, as they do with this building on the right, the Northwest Energy Building up in Research Park. Um, uh, Governor's Plaza was designed by the Utah architecture firm of EDA, constructed in the early 1980s. And the Northwest Energy Building was designed by the Utah architecture firm FFKR, constructed in uh, the late 1970s. The other thing I think that's interesting about these buildings, and the reason I feel that late modernism was really in some ways about modernism coming full circle, is, you, is that you see there really isn't any decorative, explicit decorative element to these buildings. I would argue that they both have their own sense of visual interest to them 
but there, there is no applied, you don't see the same kind of um, colorful panels that you saw in the Granger High School uh, cafeteria or the same stone wall that you saw on that home in Holiday. Um, here you see buildings that are pretty spare, pretty plain visually. Um, and I think that that's one reason why I feel that in some ways late modernism was really a return to, um, in many ways, the original ideas coming out of the international style. We're fortunate in Utah to have some really beautiful examples of what I would call sculptural modernism. Um, these are not buildings, of course, but they are architectural in nature and they are part of our architectural landscape. In the upper left is the uh, it is a uh, sculpture and fountain that sits on the plaza in front of the federal building at First South and State Street. In the lower left here is this wonderful, this beautiful sculptural wall that graces the entrance to the Salt Lake Public Library that is now the Leonardo. In the upper right is a carillon on the campus of Brigham Young University. And in the lower right is um, a fountain on, on Library Plaza at the University of Utah. And just as a personal side, if anybody has any influence with, uh, with the administration at the university or with facilities management, please ask them on my behalf to remove the metal U that was installed in the middle of this fountain. It's, it's really, to be frank, an abomination and it should be removed. We should celebrate the fountain as it was originally designed. Thank you for allowing me to have that personal aside. Anyway, here is a list of Utah's modernist architects. I will acknowledge two things. First of all, that this list is not exhaustive. There were other architects from Utah who were designing buildings in Utah that were extraordinary. But I believe that these architects here are the most influential. And that's my second acknowledgement that you might have uh, there might be architects who aren't on this list that you feel are more influential and you're probably right. Um, it's difficult sometimes to create a prioritization when you have so much talent. And that's really the point of this slide. We were fortunate in Utah to have architects in the middle of the 20th century who were practicing here, who were as talented, as skilled, as creative, and as innovative as architects from any other part of the country. They were really extraordinary. Well, the architectural critic and historian Charles Jenks once uh, famously pronounced that modernism died in the late 1970s with the demolition of the pruitt Igo housing complex in St. Louis, because he felt that the demolition of the complex demonstrated the failure of modernist ideals, not only of the architectural principles that we've been talking about, but also of those social ideals that we referred to at the beginning of the presentation. Well, uh, and, and a lot of other architectural critics and historians, many of them quite well, uh, quite renowned with great reputations, they're all wrong because those basic ideas still carry through today. And we still see them today, not only uh, in other parts of the country, but in Utah as well. We continue to see the evolution of basic modernist ideas, as in the home up near Park City designed by uh, Utah architectural firms Sperano and Mooney. Um, this could have been designed by Mies van der Rohe. Um, it could have been designed by Walter Gropius. It has straight lines, right angles, lots of glass, uh, extensive use of steel and concrete, but the incorporation of naturalist materials. It's a wonderful example of how modernism has evolved uh, to the current day. The building on the lower left is the Dixie State Centennial Commons building constructed in 2017 on the campus of Dixie State University designed by Utah architectural firm Sperano and Mooney. And again, you can see straight lines, right angles, geometric, very simple, no applied ornamentation, the extensive use and expression of modernist materials. You can see the expression of the steel columns here. All of these ideas go directly to uh, the modernism that came out of Europe in the 1930s. Unfortunately, we also have examples of modernism that is going away. Um, and I would say up until really pretty recently, um, 
Modernism was not highly favored here in Utah, even the more significant buildings. So we've lost, for example, the Prudential Federal Savings and Loan uh, Building uh, on, in the slide on the left. It was replaced by the Eccles Theater. And I would say again, once again, if you would allow me a point of personal privilege, the demolition of that building was one of the great travesties in the history of Salt Lake architecture. It really was a remarkable building, if for no other reason than it was designed by William Pereira, the same architect who designed the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco. Uh, the image here in the upper left on the right hand side is of the Kennecott Building, constructed for Kennecott Corporation in the mid 1960s, and it was clad appropriately in copper. So you see this wonderful copper color. Well, about seven or eight years ago, Zions Bank, uh, for lack of a better term, contemporized it with this skin. And I would say in one of the more ironic remarks I've heard, the president of Zions Bank referred at the time that this project was announced to the Kennecott building as one of the great landmarks from that period in downtown Salt Lake. So we have lost a lot of modernism. We've lost extensive build, a, a, an extensive number of buildings on the campus of the University of Utah. Um, we've lost a number of private buildings around the state. Um, and I think we need to be paying particular attention when these buildings come up for demolition because they require a, perhaps a more, uh, a more energetic argument for their saving uh, than buildings that are more hit, considered to be more historic in nature. Um, however, having said that, I want to move away from doom and gloom to the fact that we are saving some significant buildings and some not so significant buildings. The building on the left is the Northwest uh, Pipeline Building, not to be confused with the Northwest Energy Building, that for years served as the public safety building for Salt Lake City, um, and it is now being converted, I believe, into apartments, but it's going to be part of our architectural landscape, as it should. On the right is an article from the Tribune about the homes tour that Preservation Utah through Salt Lake Modern conducted last fall in a subdivision in Holiday. Um, and the homes that were toured were homes designed by Steve McDonald, the architect mentioned earlier. So we're starting to, I think, gain a greater appreciation of modernism. We're starting to gain a greater appreciation, not only of what it means architecturally, but also what it does for our architectural landscape, how beautiful many of these buildings are. Well, I wanted to close with some thoughts about how modernism through its evolution, not only in Europe and in the United States, but here in Utah in particular, has affected our architectural landscape. I think first of all, as I mentioned, uh, when I talked about the influences on the founders of modernism, we've seen evolving ideas about composition. Think about a Bravenel Hall and what a wonderful building that is, what a wonderful shape, distinctive shape that is, beautiful shape that is. Well, that came out of that, that form, that shape came out of this uh, ability, the, the freedom in, in a way that architects had uh, because of what early modernists did to play with composition, to play with how with buildings were put together. We're still innovating with materials. I mean, we consider reinforced concrete and steel and glass now to be kind of ho-hum in a sense. They're almost historic materials in a sense, but we are playing with materials, particularly with different types of glass. We're even looking at composites, at structural materials that will allow us to do even more exciting things with design. And finally, I see modernist buildings in Utah as expressions of broadening cultural values. As I mentioned, when the international style appeared in Utah, it was not widely accepted because Utah had at the time very traditionalist architectural aesthetic. Um, and I think that because of the appearance of many of these modernist buildings, we started to expand our architectural aesthetic. We started to take in more, uh, a broader set of visual ideas than we had before. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Tim, you've left us all speechless. We received no questions from any of our 49 participants. So okay. we have somebody uh, raised their hand, but if you could put your question in the chat. Uh, Hillary, I have no way to call on you in the Zoom webinar uh, format. 
But we have a, question, a comment from Kim. She said, thank you, great presentation. And Tika said, great presentation. She'd love to know whenever you are lecturing and she left you her email address. So it, I would be happy, by the way, to, um, to answer any other questions or provide any additional information. I believe that you could get my email address through Osher. Um, Absolutely, if you so, have a question. Yeah. Yeah, Just email so. any of the OSHA staff and we will forward that. And I know that, um, I believe it was Hillary sent a hand raise, but I don't have a way to call on you, Hillary. So just send us an email and, oh, maybe she put it in the chat. Uh, from Karen, we have, what are the latest buildings that are popping up that are square? That are square? That are square, yes. Huh. I'm not sure what square means. Uh, I mean, that sounds like maybe I shouldn't be giving this presentation, but um, I think that it, I, I would sort of respond to that in two different ways. Square could mean a building that is a single block that is symmetrical. Square could also mean a building that is a composition of a number of different rectangles. And uh, I'm trying to think of a, a single block, symmetrical block that would have been appearing more recently, um, and it can't off the top of my head. But I think if you drive through Research Park and you look at the buildings that are being constructed there, you'll see a number of new buildings that are that are compositions of different rectangles um, that are that are um, compositions that are asymmetrical, they're not, they're not single blocks, but they incorporate different, different rectangles, different squares, if you will. So I hope that answered the question. Okay, we have a couple other questions. Uh, we want to know, and Scott wants to know when you'll be teaching again for OSHA. I'd like to know that too. You know, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm still thinking about whether to submit a class proposal for next winter. Uh, and I guess I have a little bit of time to think about that. So the answer is, I don't know. Hopefully soon. Um, Anne says, we enjoyed your architecture class last year and always enjoy your insight and appreciation for Utah. Thank you for opening our eyes to the wonderful buildings in our city. And then uh, Hillary was trying to convey to us that her father was Cliff May. And oh are part of Maywood in Olympus Cove. Yeah, You're yeah. Familiar. So Hillary, I, I need to apologize to you then because if we go back to the slide where I showed an image of the home by Joseph Eichler, I had to make a choice. And I chose to show Joseph Eichler's home, the home that he designed rather than one by Cliff May. But Cliff May designed some really extraordinary buildings and we are extremely fortunate to have a set of Cliff May homes up in, in Olympus Cove. He was, he was really a brilliant designer. Wonderful, one last question before we let you go from Chet. What about earthquake vulnerability? So I'm not an engineer um, and I will say that, so you will have to take what I say with a grain of salt if you haven't been doing so already. But I would say that any of the buildings that are built of steel frames are probably pretty earthquake resistant um, because frame buildings in general tend to be more earthquake resistant and steel frames are gonna be even stronger than wood frames. And since steel became such a ubiquitous material for modernist construction in, in Utah, as well as in other parts of the country, Many of these modernist buildings, I would say, would probably do fairly well in an earthquake. Thank goodness we have that on our side for preservation. One more uh, comment came in, I think, sure. from Kim Smart. She says, I'm Jim Christopher's daughter. Yes, yeah. It's very favorite building other than Snowbird, she wants you to know. Nunamaker, so I want, so here's, I'm going to challenge people who are still listening to do to take two trips. You can make a one trip, but you have to go two different places. The first is to go, as I mentioned earlier, to the Social and Behavioral Sciences Building and touch the building and feel the texture of the hammered concrete that uh, that building is finished with. Then get in your car, drive down to Westminster College. You can have lunch on the way and get out and walk to the south side of campus where Nunamaker Place sits. 
first of all, you just can appreciate how beautiful the building is in and of itself, but walk up to the building and touch the building there too. I'm not gonna say anything more about it, but you'll get a sense of the wonderful uh, aesthetic qualities that architects can apply to concrete through both of those examples. But Nunamaker Place is, is really one of our most extraordinary buildings. Super, well, thank you so much again, Bim. And you have people who are wanting to hear more from you. So whenever you're ready to teach us again, let us know, we'd love to have you back. Thank you, Jill. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you again. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining Lunch and Learn. Bye-bye.